in one of my Unity projects, I have a player, the player, and this player cycles through many different states, and each of the states makes the character, the player, behave in a certain way. I might have an idle state where all you're doing is play the idle animation. I might have a button. If you press it, you go into the running state. In this case, all you're doing is move the player forward and play the run animation. I might press something like space and make the player jump, which makes it go into the jump state. In this case, you have some sort of a, a little bit of an upward force as well as the forward force. So you have the player going this way. And somewhere at the pinnacle of the jump, I play the, uh, the fall animation where you're going into the fall state. So you have the fall animation and you're falling to the ground either by some unity physics or your custom phys physics. And at the end of the fall, as you hit the ground, you go back to the idle animation or the idle state. For today's example, I'm going to start with a class. I'm going to call it state. And this is going to be the base for all our individual states. I'm going to have a virtual, a pure virtual function. I'm going to call it update state. Zero here means that the update state function hasn't been defined. So if you try to instantiate this, if I try to instantiate a state, I'm going to get an error message. Okay, the pure virtual function makes this an abstract class. So what I'm going to do is have a concrete state, let's just call it state A, and this is going to inherit from the state, and this is where we define the function. Update state, I'm going to use the override keyword, and let me just say something like updating state A, this is just a simple example. In an actual game, this state could define how the player is going to behave, like the idle state. And you could have as many states as you want. I'm going to have a B state. Let's just change this to B, updating state B. I could also have state A. So you could have idle, run, attack, however you define the player's behavior. Here I'm just going to say state C. Let me also make all the functions public. Forgot to do that. I'm also going to create an object that holds all these states. I'm going to call it state controller. And by default, I'm going to have something called a function called init initialize. Let me have a pointer that points to the current state. We start out with nothing, but when we initialize, I'm going to say current state is state A. And you can pick whatever state that you want, that you want to start out with. And of course, when you have the new keyword, you want to make sure that you delete the object at the end. So delete the current state at the end of the state controller. Looks like I forgot to put this at the end of the class. And in our main, this is our actual game. Uh, I'm going to start with the state controller, create the state controller. I'll just call it state controller. And we're going to enter the game loop. But before that, let me initialize the state controller. I'm going to put the player input into a string. I'll call it str by default. I'll just call it n, just some random letter. And on every single frame, I'm going to see in, get the input, get a new line, just to make it look better. I also want to update on every single frame. Let me put a public update function here. And on every update, we update the current state. Update state. Okay, looks like I forgot to make this public. 
So that should be accessible by now. So in the while loop, I'm going to say update the state controller every single time. Let me also make a quit button. Uh, I'm going to get the first letter of the string. If it's Q, that's when we quit. So if I run this, F5, okay, we're updating state A. Whenever we get the input, we update. So we continue to update state A. We don't have any transition yet, so all we're updating is state A. Update, update, update. And at the end, if I press Q, enter, we go out of the loop. Okay, so we have a very simple game loop. But what if I want to make a transition? For example, if the first letter in the string, if this is A, I want to transition to state A. Or if the first letter is B, I want to transition to state B. Or if the first letter is C, I want to transition to C. Consider this pseudocode. You probably want to make a better structure, but Anyways, this is just an example. So once you get A, B, or C, I want to make a transition. So I might have a function called transition2, take in the first letter as the argument. And let me make the function here, a public function called transition2. And we get the first character of the string. Okay. Once we're in the transition stage, I'm going to delete the current state. So this is gone. And if the first letter is A, I'm going to create a new state called A, new state A. And you can guess that if it's B, current state the new current state is going to be state B, and the rest is, you don't have a choice, I'm just going to say else, current state is a new state called C. Make sure you understand all the concepts that are in the previous videos in this playlist, because you want to make sure that you delete the current state when you make a new transition in whatever new state that has been created dynamically, we also want to make sure that gets deleted. And we do that by having a destructor and a delete current state here. So for testing, let me write my own constructor for each of the states. So for state A, I'm going to have a constructor state A, C out, state A is created. This is a string. and the line. And I'm going to do the same thing with state B and C. Constructor for state B. State B is created. Constructor for state C. State C is created. F5. So every time we create a new state, we get the C out. B, we get state B. C, we get state A, state C. A, we go back to state A. Q, we're out. Let me also make destructors. And in our base class, I'm going to say virtual destructor. And you might be wondering why we don't have a virtual constructor. I'm going to explain that later. For now, let me just write my code. I'm going to have a override state A destructor. And I'm going to say state A is destructed. And the same thing with state B and C. So state B, we override the destructor for state B. State B is destructed. State C, we override the state C destructor, state C is destructed. Okay, so I'm going to run this, F5. We created state A, we update. We get input, we keep updating state A. 
and I'm going to say B. And that's when we destruct state A. We create state B. We update state B. I'm going to say C. We destruct state B. Create a new state called C. And it's the same thing over and over again. I can go back to A, destruct the current state, get the new state, update the next state, and so on. Okay? Destruct the current state, create the next state, update. Now, on the virtual constructor, in C++, you simply cannot have a virtual constructor. First, let me give you the, uh, the layman's terms. When you instantiate an object, you're not going to instantiate an abstract object. When you instantiate an object, you need specific info. Are you going to instantiate state A? State A. Are you going to instantiate state B? State B. Or are you going to instantiate state C? State C. Logically, you can't say, I want to create something. I don't know what it is yet, but I want to create it. On a deeper level, you have something called virtual tables in your memory. It gets created internally. You don't know about it. But when you have virtual functions or things like overwritten functions, you have an array in that virtual table, an array of pointers that point to the exact function that you want to use. So you might have a pointer inside a virtual table that points to some virtual function inside a base class, or depending on how you write your code, you might also have a pointer inside the virtual table that points to an overwritten function. The issue with constructors is that constructors happen at the very beginning of the object life, life cycle, and constructors get run before the virtual tables are created. You cannot have a pointer on a table that does not exist yet. In case with destructors, it happens at the end of the object life cycle. Destructors get called long after the virtual tables have been created. If you want to go deeper, you have to understand how compilers are written, but we don't necessarily have to do that. We're creating indie 2D games. For now, intuitively, on the surface level, you can just understand that when you call a constructor for state A, you're not overriding anything. You're specifically calling the constructor for state A. Here, you're specifically calling the constructor for state B, and the same with state C. But with normal functions that happen in the update, for example, here you may not know what the current state is. It's just an abstract idea. But at this point, you already have your virtual tables. You have your pointers internally that point to a specific function called update state. In case with constructors, you simply don't have those pointers. Let me run this again, F5. Looks like I forgot to delete these things five again. So we're back to running our simple state machine. I can go to state B, C, go back to A, update A. And this being a very simple state machine, even though the current state is A, I can press A again, destruct the current state A and create a new state A. And obviously you can add code to prevent this. Or depending on your game design, you might actually want to create a new state even though the current state is the same thing. You know, it depends. Or maybe you might want to add more features like on state enter, on state exit, when you make the transition somewhere here. There's many different ways to write a state machine. And you don't necessarily have to use dynamic memory allocation. Maybe you just want to use static memory. It depends on how you write your code, but the idea itself is the same. I would also recommend this page. It's got a bunch of design patterns that you that might be useful when you make your make your game. So Google sample code on state machines and for your homework try writing different versions of state machines. In the next video I'm going to come up with um, maybe a little more specific examples. So that's it for this video. If you have any questions you can reach me on my Discord server. I have all the links below. Thanks for watching. See you next time.